So as we start uh, the new year, you know, we've got some focus as a church. We've got where are we going? What's the vision? Maybe what happened last year, we could recap some of that stuff. But here's where I really feel led as a church. Like, what are we going to be focusing on this year? And where are we going to put our attention? And I'm going to pull this out of Matthew chapter 28. So disciples interacting with Jesus. Jesus dies on the cross. He, he is raised again. And then he spends some time with his, his disciples just before he leaves. So in verse 28, or in chapter 28, verse 16, it says this. And the eleven disciples, unfortunately Judas was gone at that point, went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Oh, that's still hard to hear when you read that. Verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I just want to pause right there. When you're reading scripture, take your time and, and listen to the words that it says. They saw Jesus and they worshipped him. And once they did that, then Jesus responds a certain way. When we see Jesus, when we give our heart to the Lord, when we um, open the door to our lives to say, Jesus, come in, we want to worship you. Then Jesus came to them. You see that turn of events, right? They didn't have to go running after Jesus. They just put their eyes on Jesus and worshipped him. And then Jesus came to them. Then he spoke to them. Oh, that's just wonderful news. That was just a little tidbit there. But verse 19, we're going to go on. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I want to pull out three thoughts here from the scripture. We've heard it many times, but there's three things that really were resonating with me. The first one, as we talked about even during the communion time, was that some doubted. You know, my first point here that we'll get into in just a moment is that some will doubt and some won't believe, and that's terrible. Um, but what do we do? Even though some doubted, even seeing Jesus face to face, right? They, they went, they saw Jesus, they worshiped Jesus, they saw all the miraculous signs that he had done, and they didn't believe. So for you and I, I just think about it's not like we're off the hook or something to think about, well, if Jesus couldn't get everybody to believe in him, well, then I'm, not, I'm so far from being perfect. But we still present the gospel and the truth to people, and they have to decide. We don't just write them off. We've got to present the gospel to every single person. Go and make disciples of every person, all nations. I love that. Not just the ones that we think are going to get saved. And the second thing I want to pull out here is that they're going to have questions. It says, go and make disciples. Well, as you do that, people are going to have questions. And we don't always have to have the answer to their worldly questions. Because we got truth. And truth is going to set them free. And as we present Jesus to them, it might not actually answer their particular question about the stars and the moon and why the, why the world is spinning a certain way. But the truth will speak to their hearts. And that's what we want to get to. And the third thing I want to pull out here is that we just need to tell them the truth. In verse 20, it says teaching them. We need to teach them and tell them the truth. It's almost the same concept of what Jesus did that we read in John chapter 8 during communion. Is that there was a flow of communication and information and it brought them to truth. I tell you the truth, I tell you the truth. You have all your questions, but I want to tell you the truth. I love that thought. Let me share a story with you. And I'm going to share a couple of stories with you today. And they're all true stories. Uh, there was a young man, and uh, when he was younger, he decided to uh, party a lot. And, you know, back in the day, you'd, you'd have certain kind of drugs. And, and then it kind of it got worse and worse to a point where you're injecting drugs in yourself. And so when he started to do that, he um, was infected with HIV, which is very incurable even still today. Uh, so the young man, he just didn't know what to do. He didn't know, he didn't go to church, didn't have a pastor, he just... He was infected with HIV. I mean, it's got to be an emotional experience when you're um, diagnosed with something. It's like, oh, man, like you, all of a sudden you, you, your life is on hold. You're focusing in on, on what life really looks like. And the young man remembers back when he was a kid. He went to a kid's camp, you know, an overnight kid's camp for a week. And he remembered, that, he remembered the guest speaker speaking and saying that there's a God in heaven that can heal. There's a God that can set you free. And so he thought, well... I don't have any other options, so he just he drove over to a church and um, got a hold of the pastor, and the pastor just prayed for him and just prayed, oh, God, have mercy upon this young man, uh, and he was seriously healed. This is a true story. He was healed. 
But to this day, unfortunately, this young man is, is not serving God. Even though he met with God, even though God used HIV, he didn't can, you know, make him have HIV, but God used that to get his attention. And all of a sudden he got saved. And so all of those things happen, but he still doesn't believe. And so even though God showed up, even though the pastor did the right thing, not everybody will believe. And that's sad to hear. So with that in mind, though, we just think, well, if not everyone's going to believe, then why, why try so hard? Why, why reach out and, and make myself feel awkward and try and present the gospel to certain people? And I think God is always trying to teach us to do things and, and to go like the disciples, go out. Because if you think about your bike, when you were a young kid, it had training wheels on it. And it was safe, right? You're on your bike, your training wheels, like nothing can really go wrong unless you go down a really fast hill or something. I guess it could go wrong. But, you know, your training wheels, you just go around, you, nothing happens. You don't ever fall over, it's easy. So God doesn't want us to live like that, live our lives with like training wheels on it where it's, everything's just safe and perfect and nothing will ever go wrong and we don't want to leave the comfort of the training wheels. Like God wants us to go out at some point. It's almost... The same like tying your shoes when you're a kid. You learn to tie your shoes, and you're like, okay, I think I got it there. And you start running around as a kid, as you always do. Oh, shoes are untied, nuts. And you got to figure out how to tie it right. And then you realize the double knot, and then your life is saved. Everything's good. glorious because you got the double knot. It's never going to come undone. But we got to keep learning. We got to keep growing. We have to keep trying. Even like driving a vehicle around. I don't know if there's a perfect driver out there. I've seen some of you driving. We actually need to, we should probably do some more practicing. But even driving a vehicle, you, you keep learning and you keep growing and you keep figuring out like deep snow right now. Like you learn how to drive in deep snow. So even Jesus did the same thing with his disciples. He sent them out to learn. He gave them opportunities to grow. So Jesus sends them out as little missionaries. Uh, two by two they go out and lots of times they failed. And Jesus didn't come around and say, oh, you bozos, you know, like he gave them up, sent them out again, you know, keep learning, keep growing, keep trying, keep reaching people. I love that idea. So Jesus went on to release people, even though he would say to them, how long am I going to have to be with you to keep teaching you? But Jesus is patient. He's kind. He's loving. He wants to give us opportunities again and again and again. It's really the, the journey with God. I love that idea. We don't know who will believe and who isn't going to believe? So we go around telling everybody the good news. We tell everybody the truth. And we let the results be God's. We let the results be that person. So that's point number one. Point number two is that they're going to have questions. When you present the gospel, lots of people, especially today, have all kinds of questions. And all kinds of angles that they can come up with. But we don't have to have the answer to every question. I love that thought. Instead, Jesus, even when he was questioned would usually turn it around and ask them a question, wouldn't he? He would, he would hear their question, but he knew their heart, so he would ask them a question that exposed their heart. I love that thinking. That's wisdom, that's godly wisdom that God will give us as we present the gospel with people. So whether they ask a question um, and get the right answer, it's really not up to us. We will try our best to answer the question, but ultimately we want to point them to truth. Let me, let me give you another story here. There was a young man, again, I don't know why I like stories that young men that used to party, I, maybe that was kind of my story as well, but there was this young guy who uh, used to go out in the world and, and, and have lots of parties, and um, at that point, again, you, you, you do things that are, are really foolish, and uh, they would always kind of one-up each other. So when you're under the influence, sometimes you do things that are very, you know, controversial. So they would kind of one-up each other. Oh, you see that thing I just did? And they're like, oh, watch this, you know. And all of a sudden, the one guy did something too extreme. He ended up in jail. And his friend that was not in jail saw his friend in jail and said, ah, it's his birthday. I want to celebrate his birthday with him. So he grabbed a 2-6 bottle of whiskey or something. He broke into the jail so he could have a birthday party with his friend in jail. Like, what? Why would you do that? And so this friend, again, that broke into the jail later on in life, um, picks up uh, hepatitis C. Now, this is prior to 2000, where hepatitis C was un incurable at that point. I know it's curable today, but it was incurable at that point. And, you know, he's, he's wrestling through life, and, he, you know, he's, he's starting to hang around the church and, and not really knowing what to do and, and what it looks like, what his life looks like. And uh, there's a guest speaker in, and it's a, it's a nice young lady. She's just an evangelist. She's preaching the gospel. At the end, he comes forward and just receives some prayer. And he just felt this heat in his body. And he just was like, whoa, 
Okay, you know, just didn't know much about it, didn't understand it too well. Just regular hepatitis C tests and results. He went in the, you know, the next week or something, and all of a sudden, it wasn't there anymore. He was healed of it. It wasn't his focus. He didn't go to the front to say, I gotta get my, you know, this thing dealt with, but he just went in obedience. And God healed him. And I want you to know that even today, that man still serves God. He still serves the Lord. And so he had, he had questions like all of us. Why, God, why did this happen? Why, why did I get dealt these cards? Why did I end up with this disease? But God used all of that to bring him to the Lord. And we see that this story, the man still loves Jesus. Remember the previous story I shared that God healed somebody, and they still don't serve him yet. I want to say that yet. We believe that he'll come to the Lord at some point. But even though you have tough questions and doubts, God spoke to him through his healing. God uses all kinds of situations. So as we reach out to people, we present the gospel, we don't know what God's up to. God might use a healing. He might use your words. He might use a situation. He, you just never know. But our God and our focus, again, is on presenting the gospel. As a church, that's what we're called to do. We've got to use those opportunities to speak to people. Again, do we have to have all the answers? And sometimes in life, we're not going to. But if we focus in on that, like, we've got to have the answer. We've got to give them the answer to every question that they ask. I believe that's the wrong thinking. I think that's our human, we're going to base our you know, experiences, we're going to base on what we share on our human ability, our, our own mind. And it's going to fail us. It's going to let us down. We're not going to have all the answers. Instead, if we focus on the Lord, if we focus on the truth, we'll be able to speak into every situation. Again, not that we'll have an answer. We might just have to pray for them. We might say, hey, I need to get back to you on that one. But we will have somewhere to point them. When they ask a difficult question, we don't, oh, I don't know. We say, hey, I don't have the answer to that question. But what I do know, what I do trust in, what I do have faith in, those are the kind of answers that we want to be able to give people. See, God's word never promises to answer every question. Let me show you some scriptures that back that up to help us to, to have understanding of all things, but not to have all the answers. Oh, I, I, I love knowing that. Isn't that kind of comforting? Like, huh, I don't have to have all the answers. Because God has all the answers. And there's somebody that I can trust that has all the answers. And there's somebody that I can trust in 2022, because I don't know what it looks like. The last two years were pretty interesting. But in 2022, we can trust that nothing's going to surprise God, because God already knows. So let's just flip all over the Bible. Um, if you're taking notes, that's going to be helpful because we're not going to be able to flip together as fast as we can. Uh, Psalm 86, verse 11. says, Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart. Don't let my heart deceive me. Let me walk in truth. That's just a wonderful thought. Proverbs 30. So Proverbs all full of wisdom here. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. When you think about that word flawless, it's perfect. Every word of God is perfect. Oh, that's just wonderful. Every word. I'm, I'm honestly going through my devotions right now, and, and I'm at back where there's just a list of genealogies. Every word written in there has power and authority and is perfect. Isn't that just a wonderful thought? Let's go to John chapter 1. This would have been a good Christmas kind of a, a verse here. John chapter 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh and made us dwelling among us. We have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. There it is again. We see that he comes. He's the Word of God, and the Word of God is perfect, and the Word of God is truthful. Let's stay in John, and we'll just flip over a little bit here. John chapter 17, verse 17. This is a great one. 1717. It's going to be easy to remember. John, 1717. Uh, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them. Sanctify really means make holy. Make me holy by your truth. And where do I find truth? The word is the truth. Jesus is the truth. Isn't that just a, a wonderful piece of scripture? Easy to remember. It's only about six words. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Oh, this one, it just gets better. I mean, it's all good, but it just gets better as we go here. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture 
is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. It should say, and training in love. Don't go around rebuking and correcting everybody. Because, but all scripture is God breathed, is truthful. And we're just going to go over just to the next verse so that, verse 17, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. How are we going to answer questions? How are we going to present the gospel? We're going to be equipped for every good work through all of the scripture that is truthful and God-breathed and makes us holy. Isn't that just a wonderful thought? Oh, I love the scriptures. Eh? Let's go on to the, the third point here. So what was the first point again? We almost forgot. Eh? Uh, not everyone's going to believe and we're not going to be able to give all the answers, but we, we've got truth and we're going to tell them the truth. And that's a great thought. I, I want you to have fun with me. I'm not here to, you know me pretty well. I'm not here to complain or anything. But last night, I'm, I'm here Saturday night, usually always preparing. And last night, I got this hyper, hypo, I got to get the right word, hypo, uh, thyroidism. And it acts up in different ways. And last night, the, the room was like spinning. I, was, I do terrible on carnival rides and that kind of stuff. I was like kind of trying to prepare. And I'm like, the room's spinning. I'm thinking, the only thing I can think of, which I say to God often, is I say this, like, God, you better show up because I'm a wreck. And, and really, like seriously, I, I don't, I don't want to show up. I, I need God to show up. I need God's word to show up. And so I, I always give that back to God. I say, God, you've called me to this. You better show up because otherwise we're in big trouble. Because I got nothing. But let me look at it through two people's eyes. So the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John. And just some things that they said as they heard those words. Go out and make disciples. Go share the good news. Go tell people the truth. What, what did they wrestle with? What kind of questions did they have? So let's look at it through their eyes. It's just brilliant. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians is just packed full. You go back and read the whole thing, but we're just going to snapshot a couple of verses here. So in verse 4, it says, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on man's wisdom, but on God's power. If we're going to present the truth to people, it's not going to be your wisdom. It's not going to be your charisma or your persuasive words. It's going to be the truth of God's word, and that's the only thing that's going to land anywhere. Verse 7 says, We speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden, and that God destined for our glory before time began. Verse 12, We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit of who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. How are we going to understand the complexity of God? We're going to understand it through his truth, through the truth of his word, through the Holy Spirit. This is what it's referring to, verse 13. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. We need to speak the truth, but with the spirit attached to it in a sense. Because when you have that, it penetrates into people's hearts. It moves mountains in Jesus' name. Verse 14 says, The man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God. If the Holy Spirit isn't in you, you'll read this just like a book. But when the spirit of God is in you, you read it and it's life-giving. It's alive. It's fresh every time you read it. For they are foolish, for it's foolish to them And he cannot understand them because they are not spiritually discerned. Verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Oh, that's great news. The world needs truth, and we have been given the mind of Christ, which again is full of the spirit, which is full of the truth, so that we can present the gospel in a way that will change the environment. I love that thought. So let's look at it through the the eyes of the apostle John as well. And so let's go to 1 John. I'm going to go back here near the end here. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. And all of you know the truth. When you're anointed with the Holy Spirit, you have truth. And what will result in that? Let's just listen to it here. I don't write to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie comes from the truth. He's writing to them because they know the truth. They've got the Spirit inside them, and they live it out, and they present it. Oh, that's just wonderful news. Let me finish off another story with you, my third story, and we'll make a final point here. 
Um, this story is kind of personal to me because I, I knew the other stories as well. I wasn't there when they happened, but the story, I was there when it happened. So, um, nice young lady uh, gets married. Un- so they're unsaved. They're not church-going people. Uh, they get married. Uh, they live their life for a while. They have two sons. And all of a sudden, one day, the husband, he checks out and, and runs off with another woman. So the mother's there with the two teenage sons. Now, I've been there before, so I understand that kind of feeling. The two teenage boys don't understand why their dad would leave them like that. And so they're just angry, and they don't know how to handle themselves. And they, begin, they just get frustrated at each other. They're not blaming each other, but they get so angry at each other. They start beating each other up. They fight all the time. And it gets so bad sometimes that they would take tools out of the shed and seriously beat each other with these tools. The police had to get involved. There was charges laid. And, and the mother's just, she doesn't know what to do. And somebody that she worked with went to church, so she re- they reached out to this mother and said, you need Jesus. There's the only way you're going to be able to make it in life is with Christ. So she gives her heart to the Lord. She gets saved. And thankfully, one of the sons gets saved as well. And I remember when he first got saved, I mean, the mom was just ecstatic when she got saved. It was just this huge transformation in her life. And then when her son came to the Lord, she was just so, oh, thank you, Jesus. She just worshiped God. He just, she was one of those people that sat in the front row of the church and was always saying amen and praise God and raising her hands because God has done a miracle in her life for, for real. And so this young man, when he first got saved, went out to a camp retreat, and I was out there. And, and man, I didn't, do, I didn't say it really. It had nothing to do with me. I just remember I was, I was at the, in this one building, and I, there was a dining hall over there. I've got to get to where the food is. I'm hungry. And so I'm walking across this, this place, and this young man comes across. And I didn't really know him at that time, but I, I, I kind of knew the story. So I just quickly said to him, I'm so glad you're here this week. And man, I love you so much. And just gave him a high five and just kept walking because I was hungry. I, I didn't have any intention. There wasn't a purpose. I thought, I'm going to tell this guy the truth. I'm going to get him saved. You know, I, there was no intention. My stomach was talking to me. I'm going to get some food. And he shared with me later, he said, he was wrestling with the thought when I said that to him. He said, I was wondering, why am I here at this camp? What is my purpose? What does God really want with me? I don't even feel like I'm accepted here. I feel like an outsider. And when I said that to him, I'm so glad you're here. And God flipping loves you, man. It just melted him. And I didn't realize I high-fived him. And he went away crying, and I went away to get some food. But God had used that specific situation because you never know where someone's at. All I spoke was truth over him, that we were thankful that he was in the house and that God loves him. There's a God in heaven that loves him. And people just need to hear that sometimes. It's not whimsical words or wisdom. All I said was, I love you. Sometimes it's as simple as that, but just out of the obedience of your heart, just live your life. Just saying, God, give me opportunities to speak truth over people's lives. What a fantastic opportunity. And that mother, I tell you, this story just keeps going and going. It keeps on giving. So this mother who's radically saved, her son's been saved. You know, the, the other son we're still praying for, he's not quite there yet. She goes to work. So she works in the hospital. She works in the area where she kind of has to clean up after, unfortunately. I'm going to be a little, uh, just prepare yourself in a sense of like where people, unfortunately, palliative care and they pass away. She'll go in the room and kind of tidy up and clean it. And sometimes the body hasn't been removed yet. And so she'll go in the room and she's just, she's so on fire for Jesus. She, Jesus raised people from the dead. I could raise people from the dead. So she's just praying over everybody. And then one day one of them actually came back to life. You know, flatline the doctor, get in here. This guy's, you know, living again. He's breathing again. And she just, you just never know, right? She doesn't, you know, she didn't say anything. Right? It was just a person. You're just speaking over them, speaking truth over them. You know, bring them back to life in Jesus' name. And it happened. Isn't that just a wonderful thought? Let's go back to John chapter 8 for a second. And just look at a couple more verses here. And then, then we'll be done. So John chapter 8, verse 31. To the Jews who had believed, Jesus said, If you hold on to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Verse 32. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. For those who believed in him, you'll find truth, and that truth will set you free. Isn't that just a great thought? Sometimes people simply will not accept answers from God's word. It doesn't matter how creative you are in presenting the gospel sometimes, or... 
even when they have questions about scientific things, you know, we've got great scientific answers to those things, and they might not accept that either. But when the truth comes, and when Jesus knocks on their heart, and they open that door, the truth will come in, and it will set them free. You and I have experienced that. For those that know Jesus, you know, we were lost, we were dead, we were dead in our trespasses, but God reached out as we opened the door to Jesus, and he gave us the truth, and it set us free. And we pray that for people, that they would receive that as well. It goes on to say, we'll flip over to chapter 14. Verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way, and no one. There's only one way. That's the truth. Now, for some people, that's hard truth, isn't it, when you say that to them? There's only one way. Not everyone wants to accept that. But just like Jesus has done, he's shown us in the scriptures, and as we looked at John chapter 8, as we're looking at this story, Matthew 28, there's this progression, right? Tell them the truth in love, say it, and then present the truth. And they have to decide for themselves. It's not our choice, it's not our decision, but we got to present it to them. But there is only one way. And as we do that, we're going to need help. And I love how God doesn't leave us alone. I want you to look at this last piece of scripture, John chapter 16, verse 13. Uh, The word he is in there six times. And the word he is representing to the Holy Spirit. So let's read it like that in a sense. When he, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth comes, he, the Holy Spirit, will guide you into all truth. He, the Holy Spirit, will not speak on his own. The Holy Spirit will speak only what the Holy Spirit hears from God and the Holy Spirit will tell you what is yet to come. Isn't that just a great thought? That the Holy Spirit will equip us because what we need to know is that if we think about not everyone's going to believe, well, that, how will we know? We're not going to have all the answers, but we've got to give them the truth. And how are we going to present truth? Well, the Holy Spirit will help us to present the truth. And that's just a wonderful thought. I love it how Jesus, you know, God up in heaven says, These, this earth is a, is a mess. These people need some help. I'm going to send my son, Jesus to set them free. I'm going to give them a way out. I'm going to give them an eternal destination. So he dies on the cross, gives us an ability to be free, and then God says, well, I better not leave them alone till they, till they come to me. I'm going to give them a gift. And, and I love dessert. And, and I think about this as like a dessert. And it's got the whipped cream, and then there's like, you know, the cherry and all the sprinkles, all that kind of stuff. This is all those extra bits. You know, the Holy Spirit's all those extra things because God knows we need help. So God gives us the Holy Spirit as a gift to help us to present truth. Because again, we can't do it on our own. Can't do it on our own strength. Can't do it on our own wisdom. We've got to do it on God's wisdom and God's truth. And we can find that in his word because that's truth. We can find that in Jesus because he is the truth. And we can find that again in the Holy Spirit who is the spirit of truth. Isn't that awesome? Three things. Praise God. Let me pray for you. Father, this morning we... We just rejoice in the truth. Father, we rejoice in your word that's truth. We rejoice that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, that sets us free and helps us understand the truth. And Father, I pray that this year as we move forward into 2022, you you have divine appointments, you have divine conversations, you have divine people that you've lined up that you want us to talk to. I pray that we'd be so bold this year. Father, you know, as we, we're a separate in a sense, we can't come to a church environment on Sunday, but the church goes out with us. We are the church, and we're going to bring the gospel to every single person that needs to hear it. Father, our community needs to hear it. Give us words. Give us wisdom. May we be obedient to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.